Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. All right. So welcome uh, to day three of the short course. Uh, this is water, 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 and more water. Um, we have several speakers. And uh, so I'm just gonna jump in and introduce speaker number one, Simon Williams, who's going to do the background on everything related to uh, measuring water levels with um, GNSSIR. And then we're gonna switch to Kelly, who, who's uh, our Jupyter Notebook expert, and she's gonna show an example for a lake. And then we're gonna go back um, to Simon for tides. And then we're gonna have David talk about his results uh, using inverse SNR methods. So I'm not speaking today, so this is just my intro, and I'm going to spend most of the rest of the uh, time listening and also answering questions. So, Simon. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. So uh, Christine's asked me to do this section, which is basically the background on models and methods we need to use for water monitoring compared to what you saw before in terms of soil moisture and snow and snow depth. So basically, measuring water levels using GNSSI is no real different than measuring snow. We'll use the same code to do it. However, there are other factors uh, that we have to take into account because of the way we're measuring water. In some ways, basically, we could consider it easier. The water surface over that footprint size can generally be considered to be flat, and we'll never have to worry about sloping surfaces, which we did for the snow, um, although it may not necessarily be considered to be smooth. The water may not be smooth, there may be waves there. Also, we need to care that the water levels change rapidly over a satellite arc, and they change over a day due to tides. Therefore, we don't really want to use daily averages for things such as um, See, but we might need to use daily average for lakes and rivers in May. So we'll be introducing the sub daily code. Other things to think about maybe are that water may change to ice, so we will have differences there. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on what you want to real measure. And then also that insulations can be a bit more difficult or problematic and influence what you'll get. Um, so we will look at that. Uh, issue first. So basically for the installations, there are, I'm going to sort of break that into two classes just in this slide. That there are two things. One is if you're going to install your own site. This is easy because then you can, all the things that are bad that you might have to do earlier on sites, you can hope to mitigate. So the installation is on the fourth day of this class, where you've considered all the factors for the good site. The other is if you uh, you have already seen a site that you might want to try to measure water levels from, it's probably been purposely installed for land movement or for tectonics or for surveying, and therefore you've had no control on its installation and you want to see whether you can actually get water level measurements from that. But like snow depth, ideally you'd like to a site with a good azimuth range with no or minimal clutter in the field of view inside the zones. Um, and in addition, it would be good to have a modern receiver called multi GNS in GNSS in 9x3 with a sufficient sampling rate. Now, the sufficient sampling rate comes a lot more important, as does having multi GNSS in water levels compared to the other uh, type, uh, method of uh, the other things, soil moisture and snow. So, what would be a Theoretically perfect site, I'm not saying that it is, but it's what you would expect to have the best chance of giving you really good water levels. It would be one that has a full or nearly full 360 degree view around it, with no obvious clutter in the reflection zone area, leading to any extra unwanted multi path that you have to deal with. It'll be something that's a good height above the water surface. To ensure you've got sufficient number of SNR cycles. Um, it depends, therefore, on your sampling rate on how long you can measure for. We'll come to that later as an issue. Um, and you want the antenna if it's something like this on a good location on a platform. So any reflected, so the reflected and direct signals are not blocked. So this is a nice example. The GNSS antenna is right there at the top. 
having a beautiful clear view of its surroundings. Similar to this, you might get something a bit more like this. Seems very similar. This one is about 20 meters from the water surface, and it has no obvious clutter and reflection zone, but the antenna is mounted actually on the side of the platform. Therefore, you've got potential obstruction of the signals and multipath from the platform itself, and that will potentially limit the azimuth range that you can see and potentially other multipath signals. Now, unless you've got a lot of money to build one of these, you're not going to put a GNSS on to a platform like this, and you're going to put it on the land in some ways. So another interesting and nice one is to have a pier, for example, that allows the, it to be almost like a platform to give a reasonably good azimuth range to generally, for the platforms you might get above 180 degrees, um, and there was a reasonable height above the water surface. Uh, but you might have issues like uh, if you look at the pier on the left, the tidal range is so large in this area that the reflection zone actually dries out twice daily. So you're not going to get a full tidal cycle if you're looking at that sort of thing, or you're going to have to deal with the fact that you've got water and land. This is probably more typical. And especially something you'd be wanting to look for in a site, uh, a nice sort of peninsula or something like that. So to give you that good azimuth range, uh, somewhere where, again, there's no real clutter and also where uh, it, it's a quiet place. So you haven't got a clutter on the land as well. So you've still got a good azimuth range. The site on the left does actually have islands. So there's that issue. And that means we could lose potentially low elevation angle data in the in the results. So you have to be careful when you're looking through your residential zones that that might not be an issue. Now we're going to a bit more of a tricky, more challenging site. This site is on the side of a hill. It was put there. It's one of the uh, uh, PBO's sites. It's 63 meters above the surface of the water. It has a much more limited azimuth range of about 100 degrees. Um, and because of that, you also, because it's sloping down to the water, it's not on a cliff face, you might get multipath off the hillside itself, interfering with the signals you want to see from the sea. And then we get to uh, the worst case scenarios. Uh, these are often sites that have been actually installed for GPS for datum control and vertical land movement at a, a tide gauge. So they, they weren't installed there for any GNSS IR situations. However, they have been, sea level has been got from them. So you can see the one right, that's Gibraltar. It certainly wasn't built for that. It has a very limited azimuth range and a lot of buildings around it. One advantage though, it does have multi-GNSS. So while it has a limited azimuth range, it has quite a lot of satellites because of having the four different systems, which makes up for that limited range. The middle one, it has 180 degree views, but again, there's a lot of clutter and you can see the other pier on the, to the southwest will interfere with the low elevation angles. Top right, you can see the blue dot is on the pier, that's what the GNSS is. So you've got a lot of boats around there all, all contributing to clutter in your field of view. Uh, and similarly, the top, the bottom two, that's St. Nazio in France, I think. Again, having lots of uh, boats in the in the in the reflection zone zone and piers and other uh, clutter that will reduce how good your signals will be. So that's one thing. The first thing is to consider where you're going to place that thing to make sure you, you want to get close to the first one and not as near to the ones in this plot. The second biggest uh, effect we need to worry about is what's called the time bearing surface effect or the H dot effect. So unlike GNSR IR for the other hydrological applications, water levels will vary or can vary rapidly within the time of a single satellite pass. So that nice sinusoid you'll get from a single height now has a sinusoid that's changing its chirping uh, as a result of tides. So this is one example. 
This is Severn Estuary, which has a very big tide of about uh, 12 plus meters. And the SNR example I show you on the right there is from when the tide's changing rapidly. The gray lines are showing the, <clears throat> the width of the time that you're using for that uh, rising or falling arc. So you can see that the points on the SNR on the right are color coded to the reflector height at that time. So it's going from uh, 19 meters all the way down to 16 meters. So there's a uh, two and a half meter range change during that, that satellite pass. So what does the H-dot effect do? Well, it causes a shift in the peak of the long scargle periodogram. So instead of the oscillation frequency being uh, 2H over lambda, lambda is the wavelength, it becomes 2 over lambda H plus this function h dot tan e over e dot. So h dot is the rate of change of the height of the water, and e dot is the rate of change of the reflector height, sorry, of the uh, elevations. So if the arc is sufficiently short, we can then assume that both h dot e dot and tan e are constants. And what we'll do is then take the average and we can therefore correct the shift in the peak, the bias in the peak, to get your true height. <laughs> However, that still means to know needs means we need to know h dot in order to get h, which is a bit of a reverse problem. How do we do that? So I'll give an example. This is breast. The black line is the actual tide gauge changing to reflect the height, and the two dots are blue dots are rising arcs and orange dots are falling arcs. So what you can see is that a rising arc on a rising tide is, and a falling arc and a falling tide both have large and expected reflectors heights. And similarly, falling arcs and a rising tide and rising arcs and falling tide have lower than expected reflector heights. So here is an example from a site ROTG, which is a tidal range of nearly 10 meters, and a H dot of up to a few meters. And we can see this, uh, the plots on the right, uh, observed and predicted H dot biases. So we're seeing that we've been predicting pretty well if we can get that H dot. Uh, the bottom right is just uh, the same plot, but plotted as a uh, correlation plot to show that the predicted and observed work quite well. So how do we account for that H dot effect? Well, uh, in the software, and what you can do normally is process them as a normal time series. You ignore the uh, H dot effect start with and fit a curve to the results in any way you, you feel like doing. And then take its gradients and calculate therefore H dot tan E over A dot. That curve can be either a spline fit to the data or a tidal harmonic fit if you think the main cause is tides. One caveat here is that this only works if you're using reasonably short arcs. If you decide to have a really long arc where the change is sufficient in both H dot and E dot and uh, elevation angle, this will break down because it's not an, you're using averages over the whole arc. So it's worthwhile, and we'll show an example of this later on, that you have to take care and make sure you do not use long arcs for this. Okay. So the second thing we need to care about for water levels, particularly because we have changing water levels and we may have sites because they're on land relative to the water. So therefore they may be higher than the ones we expect for snow and soil. We can, as I showed we how we can have sites 63 meters above is tropospheric delay. Any microwave signal that propagates through the atmosphere will be delayed. In positioning processing schemes, they estimate tropospheric zone delays alongside position coordinates and then use a mapping function to remove this effect. In GNSSIR, we'll also experience the tropospheric delay effect. The bottom two figures, the one on the left is what you've seen before, which is the geometric effect, which gives us our, uh, our periodic signals in the SNR data. But the delay is the sum of S1 and S2, which is a function of the height of the antenna and the elevation angle. The tropospheric day, it's slightly simpler. It's similar, except for the tropospheric delay is now the delay that the actual uh, reflected signal, the extra distance of reflected signal takes 
in terms of delay along that same line. So it's still those two delays, which is also a function of the height and the elevation angle and the, the delay at that time. So like the time variance surface effect, the tropic delay will cause the delay in the estimated reflector height, a bias. In this case, that bias is this term here, half change, rate of change of the, the delay over the rate of, change, uh, rate of change of the sine of the angle. So this bias is, in this case, is always negative and it's elevation and height dependent. So very often, and in most papers so far, the reflect, this is ignored because the reflect height is generally small. Um, but it certainly cannot be ignored for high science. It is easily corrected by what we call, what we do is like almost stretch the elevation angles prior to calculating this long Scargill periodogram. So the main change, especially for reflect height, uh, well, the main change is a height bias. But if there are tides and it also appear in the tidal harmonics, if you wish to estimate them, as a reduction, because it's always negative, in the amplitude of a few percent. So here's an example uh, to illustrate this. So this is a place, uh, Dale Hollow Lake in Kentucky. The antenna is about 90 meters above the lake. Um, so what we've got here is the same calculation of the uh, reflective height, but we've changed the elevation angle range of what we used to calculate that height. So the average angle. So if we use an arc, for instance, of between five and seven, then it would be six degrees, six to eight, seven degrees. So the average ang elevation angle degrees is the color coded. And what we see is that it changes for the same height we over different elevation angles. So as you go to use higher elevation angles, the effect is less. But uh, of, often you will not have that choice to be able to just use those higher elevation angles and it's better to get rid of it. So here's another example for you. This is breast again, which is 17 meters above the water. We've got estimates with troposphere delay in orange and without troposphere delay in blue. Um, what you can see here is that the orange are generally higher than the blue. And that actually leads to a mean median difference of about 11.5 centimeters if we did not account for troposphere delay and uh, about half a cent in tidal harmonic parameters. We'll go higher. This is AC12, um, which is one we will look at later, I think. It's AC12. Anyway, it's 68 meters above the water. And you can see in this case, there's an offset of around four meters where we use a range of two to 14 degrees and about two meters from five to 10 degrees. Um, but we can also see an increased scattering in the non tropic delay results. So the uh, ones with trop of the two of the Bottom, which at the moment, this is like, uh, as Christine said, we flip the reflector height uh, in the axis. So the two at the bottom with the tropospheric delay agree, but there's more scattering in the five to 10. Uh, and then without the trop, we see that uh, change of about four meters and two meters due to not accounting for the tropospheric delay. And finally, a very extreme case. This is another one a site in Alaska, AC59, which is 295 meters above water. If you were to process it without the tropospheric delay, you would probably think that you're not getting a good uh, signal at all. If we do increase in uh, input that tropospheric delay account, we account for that, we then get a nice uh, tidal signature. The difference between the two is around 10 meters at least. And we basically get nonsense results, but it's also slightly frequency dependent. If you look at it more clearly. Um, so without tropospheric delays, you are limiting what you can actually use if you're going to go for a high reflector height. Another point is what is we're calling interfrequency bias. So in GNSS. Position processing is well known that the estimated position is related to what's known as the antenna phase center, not a physical point. It is different for different frequencies, but the GMS community uses special techniques to measure the APC and they for all major antennas, and then therefore you can remove that from the position estimates. 
So in GNSSIR, the reflective heights are also relative to some phase center. However, they're not the same as in positioning. So if we use multiple frequency, we will get slightly different reflector heights. Here's an example. This is uh, of Garibaldi, Porto Garibaldi in Italy. So the top is a plot of GPSL1 and GPSL2 daily solutions. Uh, the black line is the tie gauge, which I've offset slightly north upwards, just so we can see it in relation to those. But we can see that while they're showing the, the same uh, daily variations as the tide gauge, we have an offset between the L1 and the L2 signals. We take that difference, we see it's about uh, 12 centimeters. If we look at the, uh, the plot on the left, this is the bias relative to L1. So we take off L1 and look at the bias. We can see that L2, which was the, the GO2 on there was about 12 centimeters. It's similar also for L5 and uh, Galileo, uh, GLONASS L2. And again, again, for the others. So it's dependence on the frequency. And what we do in the software is remove them by mapping them to the L1, GO1 signal. Another thing to note that the interfrequency bias is different for different antennas. So the plot on the right shows uh, site TN01 in Tenerife, which had a two different LICO antennas. The blue is GO1 and orange GO2. You see the LICO LEI8504 has a very big bias between the two, whereas the next antenna has a very small bias between the two. So you'd have to account for that by, as I said, by mapping to the L1 signal. Hey, another bias. So as mentioned earlier, that if you're measuring uh, sea or water or lake level, that we might find that the sea or lake freezes. So at that point, we'll be measuring the ice. Of course, that will be floating on the water. So we'll get difference from anything like a nearby tide gauge, which is either as I said a good thing or a bad thing, depending on whether you want to measure that effect or not. But the frozen water has a different interfrequency bias than uh, water itself. So the plot in the middle is L1 minus L2 again daily. And we see that during uh, winter, when there's ice, there is very little interfrequency bias. This is almost zero. Yet we see a very, uh, you know, a 15 centimeter bias during the summer months. Also, as you might expect, the power of the signal is also larger on ice. So you can see differences between the amplitudes of the L1 and the L2. Uh, of the spectral peak of the amplitude uh, when it's ice, when it's water. Uh, all the things that can be used to detect the ice. Another thing that you have to be aware of is, as I said, while the surface can be considered flat, it may not be considered smooth. So if the waves become too large, if you hear winds in the area, then the reflected signal decorrelates and pretty much no heights can be estimated, depending on the roughness. So here's an example of a, a place called Black Island Queen Farm in the southern North Sea. It's platforms at around 45 meters, and you'll see lovely signals there, and then suddenly you just get nothing. The plot, the orange line is a significant wave height at that platform, and you can see as soon as a significant wave height hits a certain threshold, we can no longer see the, we can no longer get waves from the long scale or periodogram, not very, sorry, the, the wave level, water level. Again, this is something that you might want to, it means that you can start to use the, the GNSSI to actually measure significant wave height, um, but something that's not good if, you're just wanting to measure water level. I want to just mention the Nyquist limit. limit. Uh, we infer the Nyquist limit that Christine talked about, I think, uh, first day or second day. Um, this is that site AC59 again, which is 295 meters. Now, if we had 30 second data there, which is the plot on the left, very small in the bottom corner, we can see the Nyquist uh, 
reflect the height levels. And that gives us the 30 second data and IQOS level of around, at around 10 meters for L1. So we are never going to measure the C using 30 second data at that site. So you might go up and might go to two second, two second data. The Nyquist frequency for L1 again is only at around 200 meters. So again, for L1, at least we wouldn't be able to see anything there. We go to one second at that point, we can see uh, the Nyquist frequency is about 400 meters and we will be able to measure with the, all frequencies. So this is something you need to bear in mind when you've got a site is what the Nyquist frequency and what data you're getting or what data you're requesting or trying to get from when you're installing a site. All right, I'll go to the last, this is the last slide. So this is about, uh, we will all undoubtedly be asked, what is the uncertainty of this? Now, this is a plot based on a lot of papers that we produced using mainly long scale scalable periodic gam, but there are also uh, in SNR, in SNR results in there too. And this is what they quoted for their different sites. So I collected all that data to give you a plot. Really, for water level, it really depends on each site, it depends on that environment you've got on there, it depends on the height of the water level, it depends on how wavy conditions you get there. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It also depends a bit on the methods used, and I'd like to do the caveat again that beware of compare against the spline because that's not a real comparison. You need to compare against the tie gauge to really understand what your RMS is. But in general, um, so I think the green in that plot there are, is uh, in Vesemar. Type results blue and red are different long scale periodograms. Some you'll see that you'll have some sites that have had multiple papers written with them and will have different values each. So it's not a fixed value, it depends on how they've done it, uh, what methods they've used, etc. But for long scale periodogram, individual arcs are generally around 10 to 20 centimeters. You will get ones below 10 centimeters in a good, really, really good site. If you're using 15 minute arcs, these squares fits in this and our type stuff, you can get around five centimeter RMS. And that gives us something like daily results of between one and five centimeters when compared to tie gauge and monthly results of one to two and even less than one centimeter down to a few millimeters uh, at monthly in comparison. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Um, do you want to, uh, uh, Tim, do you have any questions that you might ask? For Simon, before we start giving examples, or is there any um, common questions? Um, yeah, I think maybe uh, Felipe an answered it mostly, but or answered it, but just maybe for the group again, just uh, there was some curiosity why we are so concerned with the troposphere now when we were less concerned in the last few days. I mean, it's mostly height, but um, and yeah. All right. Um, I let Felipe speak. <laughs> oh, I just uh, said in the chat that tropo error is proportional to reflector height, which varies more in tidal sites and less in snow and soil moisture. But mm -hmm. it's still a proportional or a scale altimetry error. So even a snow depth might be a few percent off. But yeah. since snow is just a few meters, that's not usually a concern. Um, if any of you are concerned, uh, we do have a refraction correction in the, the, the software, but it's not as good as it could be. So it's certainly something we would like to uh, continue improving, um, but there is one, and I 100% agree with Simon. If we didn't have one, it would we, we would be producing nonsense results for tall sites. Um, there's no question about that. And um, uh, yeah, and... I think he's going to mention it later, but um, you have to be careful when people talk about the precision of your measurements, because um, we uh, in the software calculate how well does the Lom's gargles, how, how well do they agree with splines? Well, that's agreement with a spline. That is not precision. Uh, as Simon said, if you want to know how well your measurement of the water agrees with another measurement of the water, you have to 
compare with a tight gauge. So I think that's just something I want to remind everybody of as we talk about numbers. Um, and I, I think it's nice to see the comparisons that, um, and I've seen David do this too, um, published work that tries to answer this question of what is the number? And it's complicated, as Simon said, it, every site's a little bit different, but it's also a function of when the study was done. Um, my original papers had nothing about refraction. I didn't know that it was important and we didn't make that correction. Um, so um, I think as we've all, as a community, have learned more, um, we've we've uh, added these models as we best we can, and um, and it also depends on how low your elevation angles go. I mean, that's another thing uh, Simon showed uh, that that's important. Um, so uh, Kelly, would you like to start with your lake example? And then maybe that'd be a good time after that to take a break and then we'll put Simon back on the, or maybe I, and I'll leave it up to Simon whether he wants to start after you or take a break. Take a break after Kelly. Yeah. Okay. Great, okay. Let me share my screen. Perfect, okay, so I am going to go over this use case to show an example of measuring water levels. So this is station TGHO, which is operated by GNS in New Zealand. It's located on a platform in Lake Taupo here in New Zealand, and uh, this site records standard GPS and GLONASS signals. So uh, with the Jupyter Notebooks, we start again with our import. So I'm just going to do that quick. And then the first thing we always do is take a quick look at the data. So we'll start with making an SNR file. And here with our SNR file, we are going to set our orb to be GNSS and the archive to the New Zealand archive. And here I'm just setting the latitude, the longitude, and the height ahead of time since I know I'm going to need that later. So I just put all the site information together. OK, so these are what our plots look like. Uh, since we use the default elevation angles, it's likely combining both uh, water and the pier reflections of the uh, monument it's sitting on. So we can try restricting those closed reflections coming from the pier by using maybe a larger lower bound. So let's maybe compare the defaults with 5 to 15 degree elevation angles instead of 5 to 25 instead. So this is how we would change that here. So since uh, 5 is already the minimum, we're just going to set the, uh, the maximum E2 to 15. Great, so this does look better. It is possible that the clutter near the monument is also producing noise at the smaller reflection angles, which is what this could be. So we could also change our heights to be from maybe two to eight. So we'll go ahead and change that here. So this one's a little longer, but we can see all the changes that we're making here. All right, so this is looking pretty good. Um, we're going to look at the metrics and we'll try to keep in mind uh, that maybe our amplitude looks pretty good at nine and our peak to noise, I think three would be a good value that we'll set later for our analysis. Uh, we can also look at other frequencies. So we'll try looking at uh, L2 next. And so how we would do that is adding the FR uh, and our value for that is two. Again, if you look at the documentation, you should be able to see what all the different values will be for the frequencies that you want to see. All right, so this is what this looks like. Um, it doesn't look really good, so I think we're going to not use L2 in our analysis. We can also look at even more frequencies. So next, we'll look at our GLONASS frequencies. Our values for that is 101 and 102 for L1 and L2. So here we can see we've added that. Great, so these are actually looking really good. I'll show both of them here. 
Um, so just looking at these as well for our, our metrics, I think we're going to exclude uh, the azimuth angles maybe between, say, 135 and 225 degrees, since there is an empty region here as well as a few poor retrievals. Uh, so just another thing to keep in mind um, is water levels when it comes to weather or wind. So as mentioned by Simon earlier, wind can cause roughness and we'll get bad retrievals in that case. So for a day with no wind, we could have really large amplitudes. And then for a windy day, it could look something like this day, which obviously looks terrible. So it is important to keep that in mind when you're choosing a day to look at. You don't want to give up on your site if you're seeing something like this. Maybe look at the weather. All right. So Let's go ahead and run the analysis. So we're going to set the values we discussed into our make JSON function. And we can also print out what that looks like. So here I've just set all the values that we picked, and then I'm going to run the make JSON and print out what that looks like. And so here are our current values, but we did want to change uh, our frequencies and our azimuth angles as well. So we're going to do that in this next cell. So here I'm opening that file and then I'm going and I'm changing our azimuth and I'm just going to remove those uh, azimuth angles between 135 and 225. And then I'm going to set our frequencies to just use L1 and then GLONASS L1 and L2. So I can print that out just to make sure I see those changes in here as well. All right, so now we would then run um, right next to SNR. We're going to do about six months in 2020 uh, or day of year 130 and end it at 319. Um, I, again, have run this ahead of time because it can take some time to download, but this is what the command would look like, making sure that we also keep our orbit and our archive here. All right, and then next we would run GNSSIR. I have included some of the command lines, so you can kind of compare what those would look like between the notebook uh, as well. So we run this. Again, I run this ahead of time, but this is what our outputs would look like. Again, telling you where all of the results will be. Okay, so... Uh, now we'll use our daily average utility and we'll set our median filter to 0.25 and uh, our minimum number of tracks required, we're gonna set to 50 and we will run this. All right, so these are the four plots we saw previously. So we have all of our reflector heights. These are our daily mean reflector heights. Um, this is, in some of these, what maybe an outage could look like. That just means that maybe some RINEX files were missing when we were downloading it from the archive. And the other thing is you just did it weekly to make it run faster. So there's fewer results. Yeah. Right? Um, this one, I think I have weekly set to false. I just have it always in there. So we do have these settings for, um, I think, maybe I mentioned this yesterday, but just to make the notebooks run faster when you want to run through it, you can set weekly. Did I have weekly in here? Maybe. I forgot to take it out. I think it's false. But yeah, so uh, if you do have weekly, you will get less, uh, well, less values to run with. But this is then how you would see your daily average reflector heights for water level for this station. And so I think. This is time to take a break. Um, I just want to make a quick comment. Um, so, and my brain's not quite working here. Um, what was I? Oh, Lucas, Lucas. Lucas Holden wrote a nice paper um, comparing, I don't know, like a decade of lake levels, a long, a long time series using the techniques that uh, Kelly described there. So um, if you're interested in this data set and you know how well the method works on, um, Lakes. I think that's a good paper to start with, and it's uh, available, I think, illegally on my website, so feel free to download it. Um, so we're going to take like a 10-minute uh, break, so about 5.50, we'll come back, uh, uh, German time. So uh, see you soon. Okay, um, why don't we go ahead and get started with the next uh, section, and Simon's going to lead off, and then, and then David will follow.
Okay, so these are going to give uh, three examples to you. Um, I'm going to start off with reiterating the usefulness of using the tool for picking Fresnel zones. Um, always remember to look at your reflection zones using the, this app. It's very, very useful, especially for the sea level where you might be on land and so you need to know what's around you. Uh, it really is the best way of choosing an appropriate mask. One of the questions the other day was what happens if you don't know reflect the height um, or how to calculate the mean sea level? Well, it uses the geoid if you know the ellipsoidal height at the site you're on, or if it's a known location in the Nevada you know, database, it will calculate the mean sea level for you. It's also a good idea if you've got a high tidal range uh, and you have some idea of that range. It may be useful to check both the maximum and minimum heights as this will change the Fresnel zone area. Uh, the same can go for rivers. So it's a very useful tool to have to, before you start processing. Okay, so we'll give a little bit of a slight background to sea level measurements using the GNSSIR. One of the first studies was with a single receiver was from Christine, where they uh, looked at, um, I think this is SCO2, uh, showing that similar plots that we see now already, periodic arms are using LTC only, uh, and then comparing it to NOAA data. This was the first study of the site, uh, SEO2 at yeah, Friday Harbor, and then they showed that uh, over 16 odd days, you could measure the uh, sea level quite well compared to the NOAA gauge, which is nearby. And they had for a three month correlation about uh, uh, correlate, uh, theme of comparison, they had a correlation of about 0.98. The next big study uh, on this was the accident of tide gauge. This is this whole point of using GPS that was installed not to uh, sea level, but could see the sea level itself, and therefore we can get an accident to tide gauge, as they called it. This was another site in Alaska, Kachemak Bay, a site called P-Bay. It had, again, it had a very high tidal range. Uh, and at this point, they introduced the concept of the time varying water level effect and showed how you could compensate for it. Uh, in 2017, a group of us looked again at the Friday Harbor data. We then realized we'd had about 12, uh, 10 years of data. So this was a view of looking at it in terms of its long term suitability. So it was that same site at Friday Harbor, SCO2. Uh, we had data from 2000 to 2017, and we only used L1 in this case. Uh, the table on the right shows an estimate of the amplitudes and phase lags from the tidal, uh, from both the acoustic gauge nearby and the GPS, and they matched really well. The biggest one was the K1 in this case for SCO2. They both have a amplitude of 76 centimeters and a phase of 280-279. Now, note in this that at that point, because we're using only L1 GPS, there were really only 30, you around 30 measurements a day on average. So we can go and look at that data from that site at that point using GNSS, uh, using the original defaults. Uh, so we go ahead and type those two in. Uh, for, the 2021-15, and we would see using the defaults, so we'd see a signal there, but we're using defaults of the reflector height between 0 and 6. Um, you can see that there may be a signal, but it's higher than what we expect from the default values. So we go ahead and change those default values, so we'll change the heights to look at between, in, from 0 to 6 to 3 to 12 and um, have the elevation angles between 5 and 13. We can now see a much better region where there's a good signal. So you can see that in the roughly from just before 50 to 240, we see a, a pretty good signal there. So to reiterate, if we remember to use the reflection zone tool, we would see that basically, yes, that's where we would expect to have the good signals from it. So if we go ahead and make more 
SNL files from that go from 20, 2115 for till 45 and use Genesis orbits, uh, make JSON input and analyze the data. At this point, remember, we're going to have to use the sub daily module for sites with that have tidal signals. So we're going to go and look at that sub daily. So the first section is to give you feedback on your data set. So you can, this first section will let you look at outliers, whether you should go back and change your mask because the outliers are all in a certain region. Uh, should you apply reflector height restrictions? Should you change your reflector height restrictions as well? And which constellations are making the biggest contribution? So the first section is only the largest outliers using the 2.5 sigma from the daily average, but that can be changed on the command line. So to compare with that earlier study where we only had 30, 35 measurements per day, for a more recent uh, data set, uh, we're getting somewhere near 250 measurements today with about 100 from GPS, 70 from Galileo, and about 50 from GLONASS. So we get many more retrievals compared to what we did for that first study. So we can then go and look at those things and compare them to certain other parameters. So the top one is the reflect height with respect to whatever signals you're getting. See if any of the signals stand out as being anomalous. Sometimes you do. Um, some of the Beidou signals may sometimes be anomalous. Or in the middle part, we got reflect height and azimuth. So if there's any azimuths which are standing out as bad, they might show up in this plot. And then against amplitude. So amplitude might actually tell you that maybe, for instance, you, you're clipping at your low elevation angle land or something, and then you would get a different amplitude and that might show up in your plots. We also can have a quick plot of the reflector height with respect to asthma. So here we see the, uh, the outliers are all around 140 degrees, something like that. And you might ask yourself why those points are considered outliers when there are similar points at that same height and azimuth that marked as good. So why are them? So just remember that this is an azimuth plot and the time varying aspect doesn't show up. So these outliers are probably when the reflector height is expected to be low, um, they, they come out as high. In fact, that azimuth is where these outliers show was excluded in the tenure comparison paper. Uh, this is where we excluded a, 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 a set of azimuths in the original paper. So if we look at the raw reflector heights, and it's from the sub daily, uh, we only have a few outliers. So it means the mask we've got is pretty good. Um, but what we can see is those are outliers again, and indeed they are at a high reflector height when the tide is low. So uh, they are anomalous. So we can go ahead and move that. As I said, we can change that sigma from 2.5 to change that to others. So the second section, after we've decided we've actually got a good, good result there, is to go ahead and compute and apply the RH dot correction. So the code uses spline to calculate RH dot in this case, and it also uses a spline to remove small outliers, um, to use small outliers, and also to compute and remove that into frequency bias. So, and after all that, we'll compute a new spline, um, and you can request to evenly sample the reflector height from that spline, but it is a spline fleet, as we said before, and it is not the truth. It is smooth, and not all water measurements have a smooth behavior. You also can control the spline by setting the number of knots on the command line. If you set them too low with a very tidal, big tidal signal, it might not go so smooth or go through those tidal signals very well, and it would not be good for tidal harmonic analysis afterwards. So, what it does at this point is fit that spline and use that spline to compute and apply the RH dot effect. Um, if we look here, uh, it will report the RMS with and without that correction. So in this case, we have with out the RH dot correction, we got an uncertainty of about 16 centimeters. With it, it's reduced down to 13 centimeters. And then we can take those residuals to the spline fit and uh, set that threshold and it will remove all points greater than that threshold uh, to remove the three sigma areas. We can also look at that RH dot and the RH dot 
and the RH correction, so you can make sure it isn't doing anything very weird. So in this case, it's looking pretty good. So the top one is the RH dot actual correction, uh, and the bottom part is actually the, the gradients, the meters per hour changes. So we're looking pretty good for this one. So after all those modeling steps, we compute a new RMS, and you should see that things have got better. But again, as you say, it's a comparison with the spline, it's not a comparison with the truth. Uh, if we've got both the interfrequency correction now and the RH dot correction, we've now reduced the uncertainty down to somewhere near nine centimeters. But we can iterate again, so we can see where those outliers are coming now from now, and you can exclude those azimuths in the sub daily, or better fix them in the JSON and rerun GNSSIR. So we can see that there's a, a bunch of outliers with uh, at around 230 degrees azimuth and half a meter. So we could set that to not look at that area and then reiterate. So if your goal is to understand the accuracy of the sensor, you have no choice but to compare with another sensor. So you really should compare, if you can, to one that's better, and that'll be a tie gauge. So this is a plot of the GNSS results compared to the NOAA tie gauge nearby. And a correlation plot between that NOAA gauge and the GNSS IR showing that we've got a very good correlation of 99.4%. So we've done a good job. So can it work at taller sites? I talked about this earlier on about you know using the taller sites and the fact you'll get chop circuit delay errors, et cetera, uh, and other effects. So again, it's a more, this is a more challenging site due to that height. Also, if we look on the operational zone map, we can see that there will be, it's, the site is on a peninsula and there is a uh, penismus to the south. Uh, so we should have difficulties to the south. In this case, we're using Fresnel zones at uh, 5, 7, and 10 degrees rather than the more usual 5 to 10 to 15 degrees type or 7 to 15 degrees. So when we go get our line X to SNR, we can use special mode where you want to keep data below those elevation angles of 10 degrees to save um, space. So we'll set the iron X to SNR. Uh, we have the SNR 50 mode. And we'll set, because we know we're going to have to have a high rate, so the rate to high. The code uses SNR66 as the default, so therefore you need to specify that in both QuickLook and GNSSIR. So we do a quick look. We can see that we are getting peaks at around the 65, in the 65 to 70 meter range. Um, in most quadrants, you see some scatter in some areas. This is for five to 10 degrees range. So we go look at the quick look retrieval metrics. And as predicted, we, we see that there is this uh, bad data set to the south from around you know, 140 to 200 degrees, as we would expect. Now, note in Quick Look, it doesn't use a refraction model to speed things up because it is Quick Look. So it's not as good as what we will get in the, in the final solution. So we can go ahead and make more SNR files using 9x to SNR, set in our elevation angle uh, and our make JSON input with an elevation from 5 to 10 and the height 60 to 75. We decided basically for that site, we don't really need the one second after all, so we can use a desk deck option to make the run code run faster. So we're going to decimate it to two seconds and then run the sub daily. So at SCO2, you almost have 250 measurements a day, but AC59 being where it is, has only got GPS. So we get down to somewhere near around 100 measurements per day. But that receiver now actually because GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo. So we then go again, look at the, uh, the metrics of the signals at the top, the azimuth and the amplitude to see if there's any sort of obvious uh, things happening between if one of the signals is bad or one azimuth is bad or the amplitude is bad. A quick plot of the reflector height with respect to asthma shows no real outliers, so we're good to go there. And again, looking at the, the final results, well, 
of the first part uh, with daily averages and 2.5 sigma looking for outliers. So part two, we'll now do the RH dot correction. So we'll fit that spline and we'll get a reduction from about 16 centimeters to 12 centimeters with the correction. We look at the bottom, we look at the residuals to that spline and we can get removed, further removed using three sigma, some more points. Again, the RH dot correction, the site still looks okay. So we get our final correct and RH values for 812. And uh, again, I think that says it's an uncertainty about 10 centimeters with a few outliers in. As I said, the, the, that site now has uh, multi-GNSS there. So we'll go ahead and look at more recent data for the same site. Uh, similar make JSON and run it for a few years. And we'll go straight to the final plot. Uh, with RH dot correction, the interfrequency correction, and the outliers removed, we see good uh, results. But note that in this area, we suddenly get a lot a smaller number of observations during that period. And that is probably because it was windy and there are waves in that region, uh, removing, making, causing bad signals. So the final site is a river site. This is TGGO in Germany, um, quite a wide river. Uh, the site is about 12 meters above the river and we're looking at Fresnel zones and we pretty much get almost a 360 degree view there, but we might be worried a little bit uh, in this region because we're slightly maybe clipping the land there and we'll have effects from the land itself because the banks will be higher slightly. So we're going to use Rhinox 3 for the access to the best signals of this one. So we're going to use the long station name, which will tell the code that we want looking for Rhinox 3 data. So the code for that is TGGO00DEU. Uh, and the archive is BFG, and we can use either the rapid or the GNSS orbits. And we're going to use sample rate of 15. Now, why are we going to use 15 seconds? I said just then that it's, it's around a height of 12 meters. And if we look here again for L1, the 12 meters would be right at the Nyquist frequency. So we do not want that for 30 second data. 15 second data will give us that Nyquist frequency above what we need, or below what we need, above what we need. So we do a quick look. So we see that we have periodograms in all four geographic coordinates. Um, and we look at the retrieval metrics. And we look in, in, in this region, you get a lot more bad signals. And that'll be that southwest quadrant where I said that there is possibility of just hitting the land there and the effect of the land in the wet. So we'll go ahead and remove them. Estimate to reflect on height. And then again, using sub daily, looking for things you might want to change. So uh, looking at the retrieval heights, we're going to get about 200 a day. GPS 125, GLONASS 75, but not much from Galileo. Why is that? Well, it's because that receiver is quite old there. So it's not picking up Galileo so well. If we look at the uh, the metrics again, we'll see a few already straight away out right here, but everything else looks okay. Again, those, those outliers are just way outside the 2.5 signals. So we'll go ahead and do that and go into sub daily part two. Um, but we're going to look at the RH dot correction. And that has very, a lot of these outliers up here, down here. The, and this is caused by what I was saying in the earlier talk that it's the calculation of E dot and extrapolation over too long a time of period, especially for some azimuths, those ones that are low angled azimuths. So the elevation angle doesn't change, but over changes over a very long time. <clears throat> so we'll have an arc length that is too long. So this is easy fix, is to change that maximum arc length and then rerun GNSS IR. So we'll rerun that and there's a setting here that we can tell it that the maximum length for an arc is uh, 35 minutes. So we'll put that in and rerun it. 
So uh, one question is why hasn't uh, Christine changed the default? Well, that would hurt the soil moisture and snow accumulation users. So the water level users have just got to remember that they can put this uh, this change in, this uh, extra parameter. So you then do the RH correction from the R, uh, from the RH dot effect. You see we've got rid of all those outliers and we get a much better signal. Again, notice that the water levels are smooth and it's not true and they're compared with truth is a better assessment for precision. So we get our final signal here and our final residuals with respect to a new fit. And there we go. Thank you. That was great. Um, I'm sorry I didn't add a, a picture of the, the tides at this site. Uh, BFG, of course, has a tide gauge there. That's what the platform's for. And they are these funny tides. They have very, they're very sharp at the bottom. And so they're not smooth. They're not like a spline. Um, so it's, I, I'm not a tide person, so I can't tell you why that is. Um, but it's a reminder that um, spines are useful, but they're not truth. Probably so, a shallow water effect. Yeah, I, I don't know. A lot of these uh, estuaries, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not a tide expert. Um, I think AC12 is not um, a uh, use case, but uh, TGGO and um, SC02, uh, both of those are, you know, detailed in the use cases if you want to look back. Um, and and um, Simon also showed TNPP, uh, and that's a use case that people can look at too. Um, Simon, you have to advertise your site. Can you do that quickly? Yes, I am. Um... Sure, I'll share the a browser and I mean it's a fabulous resource and I'm teaching a class in Bonn and last year I showed them Simon's site and told them they had to pick a site to analyze themselves and strangely they all picked one of Simon's <laughs> sites because uh, it was you know so easy to find places so he's looked at a lot of sites and it's a great resource. So, yeah, so as part of the URC project we were tasked to, to produce a portal for all GNSSIR sites that have been processed by our group. So if you go to the PSM cell website and go to data, you'll find things saying GNSI ion records. Uh, there's a map there. Which oh, come on, shows... Simon. bring it up. Just, it? Just share the screen and show oh, it. Oh, wait there. Oh, I thought it was. Uh, no, you're not. Yeah, I don't think you're sharing the screen. I think you released it when you... Um left PowerPoint or whatever. Oh, uh, we need to press that. All right, here we go, is that it? Yeah, 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 now we see it, it's beautiful. Yeah. So if you go to PSMSL data, there's a, this uh, GNSSIR page, so IR portal. So it gives in, in uh, about GNSSI, some site documentation. Uh, but what we got mainly is this, the IR map. So this is showing all known by me at least uh, GNSSIR sites that have been processed also it's given sites that have been looked at that are either questionable or some that are bad bad because they don't have uh, any good position don't really see the sea level although they're really close to the sea level or because they don't have SNR data in the in the files or the sampling rate is inadequate for the height of the sensor but we have about 250 sites there uh, you click on, you know, maybe you can do on the TG or AC12. Let's click on one of them here. Let's use no, no. TGTA. So you can yeah, click on that. Yeah, that's one of my sites that I look at. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's a river site. It's a Gives the uh, the fresnel zones, but in a slightly different way, just sort of from the minimum to the maximum. You see that sometimes I've still got because I've done a lot of sites, I don't always quite get the azimuths quite right, and it goes over this uh, over the land on the far side of the bank. But uh, we get a plot also of the daily data, which you can download. The blue is the IR data, the orange is the nearby tide gauge, 
so we can see that, that it's doing a good job over a long time. It also gives you an inventory of what signals it's using at the time. So L1, L2, L5, L1, L2 for GLONASS, um, and then the number of observations per day. Another thing I can tell you, I, I might have mentioned it on the first day, I might not have, is that um, I've got a few scripts that help you download tide gauge data. So NOAA and the IOC website, but I also have a, a PSMSL option and it'll download, um, it'll download Simon's data and use the same output format as NOAA and IOC, just so you don't have to learn a new format. So if you wanna look at Simon's results, um, um, you can also use this other tool to just so everything's in the same format. That's all. That was great. Um, um, Tim, are there any big questions before we let uh, David start? Um, I I think uh, Felipe has answered them all directly. But uh, that's why I'm letting Felipe. Every time I've looked at a question, it says Felipe Novinsky is typing. <laughs> So I have not, I've not had to answer any questions, which has been great. So I'm just going to push ahead and because I'm curious, I'd love to see David's talk and I have to leave five, 15 minutes early. So I'm just going to pass it to you, David. Great. Uh, okay. I'll share my screen. Everybody see that okay and hear me? Anybody can give me a sign? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so I guess first off, thank you for for Christine and, and Melissa and everybody else for organizing this. It's really nice to see that there's so many people that are interested in, in GNSSIR. Um, I wasn't expecting this many people to <laughs> turn up to a webinar uh, about GNSSIR. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, this part of the code, which is something I developed during my PhD. Um, and then I kind of gave to Christine uh, a couple of years ago, maybe. Um, I'm not really, I haven't used it in a while. <laughs> so it's kind of, at least I haven't used it since I gave it to, to Christine. So it's been quite interesting to kind of um, come back to it, uh, but it it it's, it's pretty nice to to use the uh, to use it integrated into the the kind of GNSS ref wider um, software. You so, gave yeah. it to me. You gave it to me during Omicron. That's how I remember it. I was okay. <laughs> ordered it during <laughs> Omicron. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So I'll carry on. And this is uh, what I'm talking about. Is not that different to what uh, Simon was just talking about. It's just uh, about drawing a line in between reflector height measurements, essentially. And um, that's what this, this code does, but in a more fancy way. Or, well, yeah, that's what I've written here. Inver InverSNR is a physics-informed way of obtaining a smoothly varying reflector height time series at regular intervals. Um, and the, the regular intervals part is in, important um, because uh, satellite passes are, as I say, randomly distributed in time. I know they're not randomly, but if you're comparing to like a tide gauge or something, they're randomly distributed in time and water levels tend to vary smoothly. Um, what else? it could be difficult to interpret data points from the same time with different values. For example, if you're getting reflector heights from different frequencies at the same time, if you were to take that and you were to give that to like a hydrologist, they're going to be like, what do I do with like, why is there water levels at the same time? Um, and I, I guess when it is useful is, if you care about sub-daily reflector heights, like um, Simon was just talking about, so applications like tides, flooding, uh, storm surges, something like that. And uh, if uh, an important point 
I, I guess of doing this this kind of spline fitting is that it reduces the effect of random noise and in, in um, spectral analysis measurements, which is something I, I wrote a paper about. I've kind of wrote, written two papers about, um, and so this this code is is useful. For example, if you have a changing, if you have a reflector height signal that is smaller or similar in magnitude to this. Um, noise in the measurements, say like uh, if, if you like the the uh, numbers that Simon was just giving, say if you've got reflector heights that are giving kind of 10 centimeter precision, but your water level time series is moving by a few centimeters a day, you can still see that in in the uh, in the time series, but if it's kind of or noisy, then it's, I guess it's, it's not, not as nice to look at. Okay. And this is the history of this code. Um, just quickly. So it started off with Joachim Strandberg, um, who wrote this very nice paper called improving GNSSR sea level determination through inverse modeling of SNR data. And then I kind of adapted some code that he initially gave me, wrote it in MATLAB, and then I turned it back into Python a few a couple of years later. Um, and it was used in these uh two papers. I should should mention that most of the when I was developing this code was during during my PhD at McGill. I was working with uh Natalia Gomez. Okay, and so this was the, uh, I'll get into actually what's happening in the code. This is um, at least how it was in initially formulated um, from uh, Joachim's paper. The idea is that you model your sea level or water level using a B-spline curve, which uh, is a really complicated uh, way of making a spline which i don't really like um where you have all of these different nodes and they it yeah it's just a, gives you a model for a smoothly varying um curve and the important point is that uh you say you have a, a day's worth of um water level data which is defined by by this model just by say 12 nodes or um eight nodes or something like that but then you can take a water level measurement at any point uh, during the day because it's a continuous um yeah continuous curve and then the second part to the, the technique, the important part is that you have a model for your SNR data. And this is the model that um, I think this is the model that was in Joachim's paper. At least this is, I think, what is in the Invest in our code. Um, it might, it looks a bit different to some of the other equations that have been shown. Um, just because for some reason x is used instead of sine of the elevation angle um i'm not sure what other things i think this k is the wave number um but yeah so this is a, a model of the snr data and so the, the the kind of important point of this um this technique this inverse method is that this equation or this this model of your SNR data contains in it um, the reflector height, and so you've got a link between these two models, and you have real SNR data. So the idea is that you you fit your mo SNR model to your real SNR data, and then that gives you, in theory, a, a nice smoothly varying reflector height in the form of a B-spline. Makes sense. 
and I just made a couple of um yeah a couple of improvements since that initial article which uh is this first thing is actually something that um Jürgen I think says in the paper that you sh you should have to do this but um basically you have to give uh like the way that least squares analysis works you have to give an estimate for your spline nodes first to get your improved spline nodes and the way that we do that is exactly the same as the spline at least I think exactly the same as the spline um that Simon was showing um just now that takes into account the um R rh dot correction so that's uh using this this equation here and this is necessary because um if you didn't start with realistic values of the reflector height then um yeah you've and you've got like large tides you've got a water level that's varying a lot in a day then the the code will give you something but it because it's going to find a local minimum somewhere um but it's probably not going to be representative of reality or it might just take a really long time and not work so you have to give it a good initial guess of your spline nodes and the other thing that um i changed is just to simplify this spline curve because i didn't didn't like the the b spline um kind of let python handle the spline maths um and so instead of yeah having this b spline just have regularly spaced nodes and then inter cubic spline interpolation between the nodes so very very simple and here is an example did i miss anything that yeah here's the first example from uh sc02 in washington uh yeah i've just used the same limits i think roughly that um simon was just talking about uh i when doing the vinex to snr very important to get the multi gnss data for using this method because you you want as many measurements as possible in the in time um you want as, as few gaps as possible uh and i just added this is creating the input here with this is just the reflector heights or no yeah reflector height limits elevation angle limits azimuth limits i've just done this for l1 initially because um it's quicker <laughs> and also like the the issues that simon was talking about if you are using multiple frequencies then um you would need to adjust for different reflector height differences between the frequencies so i prefer to just stick with with one and there's a just one i think qc uh kind of condition that you can add at the moment to this code which is definitely something that could be improved upon which is this peak to noise limit i think it's a different calc slightly different calculation to what's in the main <coughs> the main gnss ref code which is why i would recommend setting it a bit higher um and yeah that's what the output looks like here okay and i just wanted to note on these two parameters in particular um the not space and risky so the time between the nodes i'm sorry i don't have a nice picture of this i didn't have time to make one but the, the time between the nodes is set using not space in hours um it's i i noticed this morning when i was trying to uh 
play with it that it has to be an integer which is a really nice uh <laughs> nice condition because if you tried to set it too low um it wouldn't wouldn't be a good idea but uh yeah so you will this is a very important parameter of all both of these together a very important parameter because in theory your water level representation will be more accurate if you have more frequent nodes so say if you have a node every hour then if you from for most places that would give you a very good representation of your water level but if there's gaps in the data bigger than the node spacing then there might be instabilities and you'll get a very unphysical um output it's and and this is i'll show you the difference it makes um but it's it's not just a bit bad it will be like really bad so you have to be careful um when setting this parameter so you like that i called I, that i made an input parameter called risky <laughs> yeah <laughs> are you a risk taker yeah <laughs> yeah that was interesting i don't i don't think i i set a parameter for it um but yeah great great naming And ju yeah, just to prove this point, I've reproduced the same uh, or analyzed the same data from SC02, but I've reduced the azimuth range by half. So instead of 60 to 240, it's 60 to 120, which means that you get much less frequent reflector height measurements. And the default of the code is to have a knot spacing of three hours, I think. And so even with that, um, the output looks still pretty believable. But if you change the if you change the knot spacing to one hour, then it looks silly like this. I think that the default is for risky to be true, but um, yeah, I just wanted to emphasize, I think if this was set to false here, then it just wouldn't, it would stop. The code would just come up with an, with an error. Um, should we set it to false? I don't remember. I, I, I thought it sent an error message saying you'll have to set risk, risky to true, but I could be wrong about that. Should we set it to risky being false as the default? I think that's probably a good idea. It's okay, probably a, it's probably a good idea just to make make people kind of think about think yeah, I more carefully. Remember what I did, but I'll fix it for you, Tim. Tim, add it as an uh, uh, issue. <laughs> okay, and then uh, I just did one more site. I didn't do uh, TGG. Oh, um, because I couldn't, I didn't know where to download the data from. <laughs> um, and I was a bit short, short on time, but uh, yeah, I've just looked also at AC, AC12 here. Here's a British TV uh, reference that hopefully somebody in the audience might I get. get. It. Okay, nice. <laughs> um, yeah, and just a few things that I did differently at this site. I should say actually before talking about this that I don't I've really just done these examples kind of brute force um because I didn't have time to explore all of the um ins and outs of the the GNSS ref code but the kind of workflow that Simon just went through is I would definitely recommend doing that before you get to using this invest in SNR um you need to make sure that you have good data before you start trying to do more fancy things with it um but yeah so with this with this site i i used the vernix snr i took high rate data um because i saw that it was uh very high above sea level i don't exactly 
know what the Nyquist or the mean Nyquist would be, but I just want it to be safe. Um, and uh, I decimated the data to five seconds because um, otherwise it would take forever. And I assumed that would be enough. That's my kind of thought process there. And I initially I set the SNR fit to false. So that means that I'm not doing the SNR model. I'm just producing a spline like what Simon was showing. And I've put a very high peak to noise limit because there was this windy data here. It still just about gets through. Um, and a couple more examples. Yeah, this, this is then with doing the SNR fitting for L1 and then separately for L2. Okay. And so here are, is my kind of summary of some things to, that I think are important um, to go forward with this code. Like I just said, I don't think it's worth using this code in VSNR if your effector heights don't look good to begin with. Always start with um, this like quick look or the at least the reflection zones web app. Um, it's really important to have good azimuth and elevation angle masks. I would also recommend that if daily averages are good enough for your application, then just stick with that. Um, and this is the same as what Simon also just recommended. It's good to have, if you specifically want to use this technique, then it's very important to have a wide azimuth of the water surface and to have multi-constellation data. So yeah, multiple satellites because you want to fill in your time series as much as possible. I would say my personal opinion that multi-frequency data isn't as important for this, for using this code, but I know that like L2C and L5 are meant to be better for reflector height. So obviously if you can get that, then, then use that. Uh, yeah, so changing this input value, I didn't really talk about it, but that might improve the efficiency. Um, just to note, sometimes when you're doing running this inverse model, it might take a very long time and you might need to change this value. And if you want to improve the code, then definitely add some better QC controls, uh, like a minimum um, amplitude, uh, a better SNR model as well would be good. And uh, yeah, the tropospheric delay correction. Um, I'm not sure what's integrated into the code, but there's some very nice work done by uh, Talia Nikolaidu um, that went really deep into tropospheric delay. And uh, yeah, I would recommend looking at that, especially if you have, uh, if you're analyzing a site that's high above sea level. Hey, that's all I have. Thanks so much, David. Um... I think Christine had to leave, I believe. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't see any open questions currently. Um, yeah, thank you for, well, I should say specifically, thank you for making this contribution. To there the was repository. one question that I answered. Oh, but, okay. But David should answer more. So that was, does Invest and I work well at the end of the time series? So there it can be, I asked to have an idea if it can be used to produce RH estimates in real time. Can, sorry, can you repeat the last bit again? Uh, so the, the question was, I asked, I asked, so basically to have an idea if it can be used to produce RH estimates in real time, is what the, the person asked. In, uh, 
right in in real it's time kind of the bit where you're at the end of the times is always yeah yeah so th that's uh, a, a difficulty if you um so there's kind of two ways to get unphysical or bad results using this code um one way is through well i guess they're kind of related but um is what i already talked about where you have gap, big gaps in the data and you've got too many nodes then you'll get these kind of instabilities but you also get instabilities at the ends of the time the beginning and the end of the analysis period just because you're extrapolating at the at the end as opposed to interpolating um and the the code does kind of take that into into account because it, it produces an extra node at the beginning and the end so the idea is that you could string them together and just get rid of the beginning and the end node um but yeah this is for for like real-time applications um this is a this is an issue to to try and deal with um it's difficult to produce produce GNSSIR levels in real time, from my experience, at least. Yeah, I guess, David, I have a follow on question for you, just to since we have a minute. I guess what's the what is the limit? You know, if the assumption is the water is varying, the water height and the reflector height is varying smoothly. Is there what is the limit of that? The sort of dynamics there. How fast can it vary or not? I think a good um, yeah. I think looking at sub hourly um, reflector heights, I think is uh, tricky. Um, I wouldn't necessarily trust or sub hourly kind of spline output even i wouldn't necessarily trust that data <laughs> personally um if you're looking for kind of yeah like five minute changes or something in water levels i don't think that's possible with with gnssir but i'm happy to for somebody to to prove me wrong, I guess one one way of of working out this limit is taking a water level time series that you're interested in, or like from a high gauge or like a gauging station or something that is similar to where you would want to set one up, and then you can just directly fit a spline to that tie gauge, and then you can look at what the that that would be your like uh, lower limit of what your error could be if you had perfect GNSSIR data. I don't know if that makes sense. I think I can answer from a also from a tie gauge perspective that uh, if you want to estimate tidal harmonics, the the more the, the longest time span you can use is one hour. You have it less an hour or less. If you go beyond an hour, you're going to get into trouble with some of your harmonics uh, and the biases due to the harmonics in that respect. So you know, for tidal analysis, they'll generally use an hour or fifty meter, fifty minute, ten minutes, six minutes. So, uh, and one of my points when I was saying about. Um, the spline and tidal harmonics issue is therefore your knots you would kind of want those knots to be 24 in a day for it to really reflect every single pretty much get all the harmonics that you're going to need so there's that trade-off that for the spline clip does a good job but if it, somebody then took that spline and thought i've got it they're gonna have real hard trouble when it comes to say they want to do harmonics from it so it's more of a comment and to be wary of what you're doing with it 
uh, other than the actual technique itself, well, it's fine. Uh, as you say, if you go to too many knots, you get too much problems to do with. If you go to those hourly and the end of the gaps, you're in trouble. But just to be wary that if you didn't, you know, your your M4s and your things like that are going to get really affected in certain places, especially if they're not semi-diurnal type tides and then mixed diurnal or something like that, which are very weird characteristics. Mm. Yeah, it's nice to see some uh, some water levels from the Severn Estuary. It's near near where I'm from. All right, <laughs> it's crazy there. Twenty yard meters. It's just that's a part of the swap project as well. Yeah, and um, we have a few more questions that popped in here. Do you have? Uh, do you, are you all familiar if those water height measurements have been compared with? those obtained through radar altimetry? Yes, we did a, a one paper looking at a site in Greenland or Greenland sites. I think the trouble with the radar altimetry is radar altimetry doesn't do well near the coast and you're naturally measuring near the coast. So you have to have a, you have a problem that you're not measuring at the same point. And I guess if you had a, if you were at a point where it's, tides are big or not well known in the radar system then you're gonna have problems there so in pl some places they they do very well in other places not so much and then uh another question here uh the upper 25 degree elevation cutoff is related to the dampening of snr interference pattern this dampening is mostly related to the reduced power of the reflected signal or the increased effectiveness of the antenna to block reflections do side-looking antennas get SNR data at a higher than 25 degree antennas? Sorry, 25 degree elevations. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel like they've answered their own uh, question here. Um, I, I, at least I think it's, it's mostly to do with the um, antenna uh, gain pattern. And so turning turning the antenna to the side means that you can you can get um higher than 25 degree elevations. There's there's an odd oddity to that though, that it does do much better side looking, but you have a much narrower angle of view because of the, the chokering there is causing blocking in, in other directions, not even 180 degrees. Right. 90 degrees. So what you gain in uh, longer elevation angles, which may not always be good if your water levels change in the RH dot effect, but you are restricting the amount of asthma view you will get. Great. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I think it Oh, there's one more question here. Can these approaches be used to measure surface water extent, including river width? Um, I, I guess I, I don't think that these codes can directly be used to measure that, but you can definitely use it, like you could definitely use GNSSIR to try and measure water extent. Um, but I, unless I'm missing something, I can't, or maybe, I guess maybe with the kind of quick look plots, that would kind of give you an idea of water extent. Um, yeah, I don't know, Simon, you want to? Yeah, I mean, to do river width, it would be where, this, where you're getting a signal. So if you saw, if you went from whatever azimuth to whatever elevation angle to another, or Elevation angles and azimuths, and saw that the uh, Fresnel zone, you know, that the signal was blocked or removed. Then you could say, well, that may be the uh, the one bank, and if it was right next to the other bank, you could maybe see that. But I just I think the uncertainties in that would be so great that you just wouldn't want to do it with GNSSIR. There's probably much better ways of doing it. Well, well, great. Well, thank you. Um, just we. I think we can end a few minutes early. I'm sure everyone will appreciate that. Uh, tomorrow uh, will be our last day. 
uh, which will be focused on sort of forward facing things, how to build, uh, what, why is it hard to find good data, how to make a good installation, and then uh, low cost sensors and how to report bugs and really sort of the community aspect of this software. So, well, thank you all. Thank you, Simon, Kelly, and David for presenting today and Philippe for answering questions. And um, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. And thank you, Melissa, again, of course. <laughs>